Hello, welcome to the latest Hung La series of um, short author interviews with authors that we like. Uh, my name is Nick Quantrill. I'm one of the festival's co-directors and author of the Joe Garrity series. Uh, our guest today is Rob Parker. Hi, Rob. You all right? I'm doing great. How are you, Nick? I'm not bad, thank you. I mean, Rob, I was quick bag with So Rob is an, an obscenely prolific writer from the northwest of England. Um, he's the author of the Ben Bracken thrillers, uh, Standalones, Crooks, Hollow and Black Stove, and more recently the 30 Miles trilogy featuring... Uh, Detective Brendan Foley. Uh, Rob is also the co-host of the hugely popular Blood Brothers podcast and um, co-runs the Blood Brothers Big Book Blowout online festival. That's a lot of bees there, Rob, for me to get my, my, to get my northern home <laughs> bowls, bowls around. So. <laughs> You've done, done a better job than I've ever done there, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> when do you find time to sleep, Rob? Because that, that is a huge amount of work you've piled through in the last few years. Well, it, it's um, I've got... I feel very, very lucky to be where I am at the moment, but um, I'm... I think I've just I've realised that if I if I keep pushing and, and and keep trying and keep going, the chances of me being around a bit longer, I, I feel I get a stronger every with every bit of effort I expend. So I'm I'm here. I feel like I'm here on this planet to grab this opportunity with both hands, and just keep squeezing as hard as I can out of myself. So the, the candle with myself, the candle doesn't necessarily like burn at both ends. It burns. Like it, it just incinerates on sight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant, brilliant. I think I think it's, it's commendable, Rob. You know, you're making us all look bad then with your work rates. So you just slow <laughs> up a little bit for just a little while. Just give us a chance to catch up. So <laughs> let's talk about mind your, in this, mate. your latest one, which I've got a, a copy of here, and your enemies closer. Um, I'm looking at a copy of it because it's out as an audible original at the moment, isn't it? But obviously, the print is to follow next year, the paperback and hardback through um, through Red Dog. So. Um, it's the second of the trilogy, um, but it, you know, as, as a reader, it stands alone. I think very much so. Um, just bring us up to speed with with where this story takes us and what it's about. Yeah, well, um, uh, readers of the first book will know that it ended. Um, the, it, the first book was about twenty seven bodies found in a mass grave in a, a deserted patch of Warrington woodland. And it was about um, what effect that would have um, on the people investigating it, but also uh, what happens when you work out the identities of who's in there. And it's really it's sort of like a crime saga with um, with family t tendrils of family, mm. uh, sort of snaking right the way through. And um, the book ended with um, everyone up in the air, really, uh, as to where they were going. And I don't want to spoil that area for anybody else uh, yeah. for readers who are fresh to it but um we open up the, the next book where everyone's sort of the main players have all gone kind of their separate ways a little bit and trying to hold on to what semblance of life they've got left but before we know where we are di brendan foley uh ends up uh, with a price on his head from a main player in the uh, northwest underworld and it's really a, a race against against time to keep him safe and keep his family safe and who will be left standing is the big question yeah, um, I, I had a blast with it, Nick. To be honest, man, I, I, I loved it. it. Yeah, it was. To, to be honest, one of the nicest things about this has been that it was always contracted as a trilogy. So I was always able to go right. I know that this is going to end when it ends at the end of the third book, and I can I can sort of do a complete arc across three to get there. But I also I feel like I don't have to hold anything back, and it's given me great freedom. Um, I've really enjoyed working on this. Yeah, was it a different process than to write in the other books? Like you say, because you knew it was going to be a trilogy, that framework was already there. Was it a different sort of experience in that sense? Yeah, it's a funny one because the first book, um, Far From The Tree, um, was just written because I, I wanted to write my next novel. Um, and I, didn't, I hadn't been in audio at that point either. So I hadn't paid any attention to um, it being in audio or anything like that. And it was only as I got to the end of writing that that I thought there is definite scope for this to be a trilogy. I didn't want it to go on and on. I wanted a definite ending to this, um, which is so great. It is, I feel there's a bit of pressure to it. I feel there's pressure to, because I want to make sure we everyone goes home from this um, satisfied in a story sense. You know, um, uh, there's going to be no easy way out for anybody. Um, and um, I love that because I like that in the fiction that I enjoy. You know, I like it when nothing has that neat bow or resolution. I like it when things yeah. take its toll and we go to dark places. I enjoy that stuff very much. Um, so I've enjoyed this. Yeah, this has been one of the one of my favourite writing experiences, this. Brilliant. Let's talk a little bit more then about Brendan Foley because he's kind of the heart of the book, isn't he, I think, because, you know, as your lead detective. How do you go about creating such a compelling cop in that sense? Because, you know, there's so many about it, isn't there? You know, there's so many brilliant police procedural writers out there how do you kind of 
sit down and think, right, I'm going to create my own copy, make him distinctive from the rest of the crowd. I'm going to make him stand out to read as well. You know, was that something that went on your mind as you started to write it? It's funny that. No, it wasn't because I, I, I really, in a way, I don't see these books as police procedurals. It's funny because there's sort of scant, there's a police framework, but it's not like we're going in there and out. You know, it's not, they're not driving the story along, really, I don't feel. Um, and, and frankly, there's so many people out there doing such amazing work in the police procedural area that I, I find that untouchable. Like I'm, I'm not ready to go near that. I'm ready to. So it, it felt a bit like if I can use the word flirt, it was a bit of a flirt with the uh, yeah. police procedural. Um, we'll dip our toe in a little bit. But no, really, Brendan Foley was um, created out of um, a bunch of things, really. But one was um, I myself um, uh, applied and got quite far on the fast track inspector program for Cheshire Police. Oh, wow. um, well, deliberately yeah. also for research. No, deliberately, <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> and um, it, it was it was all online um, until it got to you until you sort of like got to a certain point and then it would be practical. And I got to the last exam um, and I failed a maths question on it and I got booted off the whole thing. Um, so the question was something like, um, if I buy a car in for X amount of Hungarian forints in 1986, what's it worth in Japanese yen in, in, in 1994? I was like, I, 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 you know, if you give me both the exchange rates, I can work it out. But the timer in the corner was like 30 seconds counting down. Oh, and I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, and ever since then, when I speak to a, 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 a police a police officer, I'm always like, have you ever done any, you know, Foreign to yen <laughs> conversions in your cases or anything like that? And the answer is universally no. So there's obviously there was a bit of an itch I wanted to scratch yeah, in yeah. my head about um, police, etc. Um, the setting was um, hugely um, influential to me because it's my hometown. Yeah. Uh, Warrington's my hometown and it's got its own unique... Um, Identity, I think, forged from with it. Well, with it being diam diametrically opposed, uh, uh, sorry, diametrically in between Liverpool and Manchester. So there's 15 miles either side, and that's why it's called the 30 Miles Trilogy because it's about that sort of like middle ground between yeah. two big powerhouses and all the stuff that goes on there. Um, so once I got that there, and then I realised that Warrington doesn't have its own dedicated police force, or at least it didn't when I first started this in 2016 or 17, I think it was. And because so we're a hodgepodge of Lancashire Police, Greater Manchester Police, Cheshire Police, Merseyside Police, and we don't have our own dedicated force, but there's a huge population here. And I thought, well, what if we create our own force, someone with a pen, a bright spark with a pen somewhere, <laughs> and a calculator says, we need our own force here. How do we fill this gap? Well, we'll, we'll get young detectives like I would have been, you know, fast track detectives straight in, um, possibly going too quick for their experience level. And then um, what about some um, older coppers who, who aren't ready to be put out to pasture yet? And the sort of like the, the frictions that that all might cause uh, in the middle and then put in the biggest crime of, you know, of, uh, you know, recent history, fictional recent history in that mix. Um, and then, yeah, Brendan just sort of popped out of it <laughs> like i'm yeah. your guy i'm your, i'm your man i'm the one you're going to follow here um and then that he was immediately followed by madison um di madison who for me was became the moral compass of the whole book and is the moral compass of this whole trilogy for me um yeah. so she's she's a, yeah i mean i i have um uh, two daughters uh, and a son but the two daughters um i just want them to go out and believe that they can kick as much backside as they want you know like because they can and i'm going to back them every step of the way um so madison is really an ode to that you know fantastic and that's yeah and as much as brendan is the heart of a novel that you used the word saga when we first started talking about it didn't you and, you, and there's a sense that it's kind of an ensemble piece into i think the novel so is that kind of was that something deliberate from the start as well you wanted to kind of bring in those aspects where we see the story from the criminal's point of view as well and we see um, you know we see various sort of peripheral figures don't we and they all have kind of an input into the story as well as the, the police aspect so yeah it was a, a kind of a, i think a saga is maybe the way i was you know you, have you i've been looking for that you actually said oh that's cool um uh, it always feels a bit um uh what's the word i, I don't wouldn't want to self-aggrandize but um, saga is what i was definitely going for yeah. because i want people to care about the cast of characters i want people to care when things don't go right for them um but I, like you say as well i do like telling a story from different perspectives because I think readers, certainly this reader here, because we're all readers, aren't we, Nick? You know, at yeah, the end of the day, this reader here loves it when I know something the main character doesn't. 
you know, and if I've learned it through the storytelling from somebody else, I'm that much more invested in the story. And I'm sort of understanding both characters a bit more. And it's giving me a more rounded experience as a as an audience member, I suppose. Yeah. Was it difficult to write in that sense? Because obviously you're juggling an awful lot of balls there, right? You throughout the throughout the story, you know, and certain characters know certain things at a certain times. So was it was it a challenge in that sense? Um a little bit. I mean, I mean we, we, I, I'm constantly learning on the job all the yeah, time yeah. with the writing st- writing thing, and I'm, I'm I feel like a magpie. Certain elements from talking to people like yourself, Nick. Like, hey, it works for Nick. Maybe it can work for me. That kind of thing. So I'll go away and try something that you do, for example, and then see if it works. So I'm, I'm I feel like I'm getting there with what works. I, I've never been a planner. Never ever been oh, a planner. Okay. Um, so, but with and your enemies closer. You're right. I found the threads quite hard to keep an eye on. So I used a, a cork board with um, index cards and just, hang on, he's finding out there. So I'd yeah, move yeah. it around, you know, and I could see it all there and I knew what was going on. Um, the only problem with having a physical cork board was that the kids could write on it. And uh, add, uh, yeah, so yeah, at one yeah. point I found that the villain had been renamed Jack Farts. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good name. That's a good name. That's, it's not that's bad, a, is it? It's that... a shame it didn't make it to the final edit, isn't it? Really, but the, <laughs> know, the final yeah. part of the trilogy will meet Jack Farts then. But, um... well, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, I know my kids would be delighted. <laughs> yeah. but let's pick up on something a bit more about Warrington. What you talked about was: Did you always want to write about your home city? Was that always kind of the intention? Because it's, um, you know, like you say, it is. It is positioned between two iconic sort of international cities, isn't it? Liverpool and Manchester, and it yeah. does a distinct character, I think, in its own right. So, was that something you really wanted to talk about? That sense of northern britain and kind of what it what it means to live in such a place because you know obviously i live and work in hull and it's probably not that dissimilar in a lot of senses to warrington i would imagine that's i, I totally agree and and yeah it, it, i imagine all um us writers from the north um encounter this same issue and this same problem um for me it was about shining a light on an area that mattered to me that gets very little coverage um there's i don't think there's there's nothing set here ever been set in warrington that i can think of that's hit any sort of mainstream notes um but i found the place completely fascinating um like you say i mean warrington sorry manchester and liverpool just couldn't be more different in terms, I mean, even back to industries that that really yeah. formed their powerhouse status, that they're so different, um, and and their mindsets are different. The people are different, and they don't like each other, and it's mad. And then in the middle, you've got this, like, yeah, we've just got this hybrid identity sitting in the middle that no one really knows is here. So you know, when I was having the um, initial trying to get this published. Um, and sending it out to, you know, Far From The Tree was written as a novel, obviously, sending it out to publishing houses everywhere. Um, I think, you know, it comes to a point where I, 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 I want to be transparent about the difficulty sometimes that we writers face, right across the gamut of difficulties that writers face. But one of them is that I feel that the North is a, is a, um, a diversity issue at times for publishers, where it really shouldn't be. So one publisher um, responded with this, well, we love the book, the book's brilliant, but... Where on earth is Warrington? And yeah. um, they, they were like, you know, that a derivation of that theme right the way through. One very big publisher said, we love it, we'd publish it tomorrow, but we've done one um, Northern Crime book this year. Yeah. And um, yeah. they'd done 100 crime books that year. I looked at the list, you know. So we do have an uphill struggle at times, you know. And then conversely, I'm looking at myself like I'm a very, very privileged, blessed, middle-aged white guy, you know, and... How am I a diversity issue? I've got no idea. There are so many of the voices that need championing more than mine. Um, but this is what the industry is like, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And was it, was it kind of that sense of wanting to capture a wider sense of Northern Britain as well? Because although it's very specifically rooted in Warrington, I think it does speak about the North in general, doesn't it? You know, it could be set, in a sense, in Hull, it could be set in Bradford, all these kind of like smaller cities where people don't necessarily know about it. They've got the same issues, I think, and that comes across in the novel. I'm really glad about that because... Um, I do think um, one thing that you do get in the north as well is that um, you can travel sort of five miles from where you're sitting and everyone will sound different, live different, do different, you know, yeah. and there is such variety up here. It's mad, you know, and in terms of storytelling that it, it, oh, it just it, it's so liberating. There's so much you can do with that, you know, um, and. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad you feel it applies to more places in the north as well, because it's certainly, you know, I, well, at the end of the day, I'm a northern lad, you know, so I, and I can't change that about myself, you know, um, I could. I'm not uh, sure. Under, no, exactly. I'm not going to change that about myself. Uh, but also, I think there's so much stories that can be told up here, you know, and I say up here like 
I can't believe I'm saying up here. Up here, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, up here. There's so <laughs> many stories that that can be told um, from the places that we we live in, we grow up in, we've grown up in, um, and I feel like we don't get as much say in it, or you know, certainly in publishing as we should. Yeah, and to, to follow up on that, I just want to talk a little bit about the audio book itself and the, the recording of it with them um, with Warren Brown. He's a, he's a Warrington lad as well, isn't he? So you know, was, is, that, yeah. was that was absolutely crucial to you that you've got the right voice on the, well, on the story? It was, yeah. the The part of Brendan Foley, um, I say part because I see it as a part. Yeah. Um, it was always written with him in mind. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, I always felt while I was writing it that the imagery side of things was always it was almost too big for for my writing if you know what I mean like I felt that the pictures and the scenes and the images were just too big for me to get into words and I hope I've managed to do a, a, a half all right job of getting it down but I always had one eye on on this being a screen thing always mm. so the first first two books are all split into um sections of three um with uh you know there's something about the number three as well that works but yeah. three parts I had uh, in mind every single bit of this is in mind for three-part series and on on the back of that I was thinking well who would be the detective um, and I need a guy who's in his you know around 40 he's from Warrington there was only ever one man for the bill and that was Warren Brown it just so happened that he uh, I box um and he is a two-time uh Thai world boxing champion um and he boxes out of the same gym that I train at so I saw him there one day about four years ago um, and it was one of them like, you know, and I was writing far from the tree at the time and I said, right, and went over between rounds yeah. and shook his hand yeah, and said, uh, yeah, I wasn't getting in the way of them fists. No, no way. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, um, you, you don't know me, mate, but I'm working on something at the minute and, um, I, you know, you'll get a call from someone at some point and I want you to have a name to the face, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't hear anything else. Audible then asked me who I'd like to, you know, to be in it. This was after all sorts of things like, he's from the north. Would Sean Bean be the right? Sean Bean's about it's 50 a, miles away. Exactly. And, and, and Sheffield is a completely different um, it is. It's an accent. So you just a whole lot of women turn to everywhere, isn't it? You know, it's that. That's just you've heard, this is it, isn't it? And just because you've heard him say the word the north on a very famous yeah. television show, you know, doesn't mean he's, you know, it's. Anyway, they don't. Yeah, that's just part of what we were talking about before yeah. but um, then yeah then Warren rang me out of the blue and said um you're that fella from the gym aren't you I was like yes I am <laughs> and uh, we we talk like once a week now you know and and I I have changed certainly with the second book I've got one eye on well, well one ear I, su I suppose I should say on what makes things easier for him when he's narrating it because he's got his own cadence and rhythms and things like that and um and it, it's great we have a good, really good relationship um because he rings me up from the studio and says like, this isn't working, Rob. Can we change it to this? You know, because this is what I'd say. Can we change it to this? And I'm always like, yeah, it sounds great. You know, because yeah. when there's that thing, isn't there, where which we all get, where it might look really pretty on the page, but it doesn't necessarily sound so yeah. great to the ear. Um, so it's really changed the way I've thought about it, definitely. But Warren's been crucial, and and of course him bringing the, his um, his profile to the project as well has really opened up. Um, yeah, opportunities for this book that I didn't expect. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm yeah. um, you know, I'm very grateful to be now followed by as many, well, I didn't know there was as many Warren Brown fan clubs around the world. Right, yeah, because he's, he's just been a responder, yeah. hasn't he, on the BBC, hasn't he? He was one of the... He has, leaders. yeah. He was excellent in that as well, I felt. Uh, it was yeah. a great show as well. Really yeah, great another, show. another great Northern writer, wasn't it? Tony Schumacher, obviously, with, with his... Yeah, friends. yeah. So, Fabulous to see. Yeah. yeah. Another aspect of the novel that I really liked was the kind of there's a there's a sort of little thread of dark humour running through, which again maybe that's a slightly northern thing possibly, but I mean one thing in particular I just want to talk about for an example was um, when Brendan Foley meets with um, with Culpepper, who was the um, who was kind of the, the the big crime syndicate boss, and he's kind of like it's protagonist meets antagonist, you know, good versus evil, and these scenes often take place in kind of iconic set piece kind of things, don't they, set piece? You, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I do, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's often done on the antagonist turf as well, isn't it, where, you know, the, the kind of the hero has to kind of build up the energy and the, and the and the reserves to go there and face him down. But this one takes place in Asda. <laughs> in <the laughs> just tell us a bit more about that. Again, is that just, was that just kind of that northernness coming out of that? You know, a sort I of... Think it is, yeah, I mean, we, we can't... One thing I did do with this book is I did a lot of research into crime in the uh, in the northwest and 
what makes people tick. So I went, um, you know, I went to places I possibly shouldn't and I chatted with people I probably shouldn't. And, but I enjoyed every bit of it. I enjoyed every bit of it. And I wouldn't, you know, and I'm definitely a sort of a, a say yes kind of person. Cause if I say yes and I get myself in a scrape, I've obviously got more to write about. Um, <laughs> and what struck me with all these meetings with people was that it's happening in normal people, happening with normal people in plain sight, normal places. And I didn't want, the, I'm so glad you noticed this because I didn't want it to be like, the big Hollywood sort of, you know, I, I think of that iconic scene in Heat where Pacino and De Niro are together at the table, yeah, yeah. the coffee table, and they've got that final, they've got, finally got that face to face. And it's not like that. There's actually, they're stood by the nappies and someone asked them to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? it, still, it still has that tension, doesn't it? And that kind of undercurrent of threat and drama to it. And I think that, that's the crucial thing in the book. But I just love the fact that it was set in Asda. It kind of just gave it a slightly different spin. Yeah. But, it, but it didn't detract from the, the purpose of the scene. There is, and, and I think there is something funny about that. You know, you can be as powerful as you want, but we've all got to go and get baby wipes, <laughs> you know, at some yeah. point or whatever. You know, it, it, no, I, I have so much fun with that kind of stuff because yeah. there are places that I go and I've been to, and I'm always, you know, I'm useless when I'm out with my family because I'm always like gazing off into the distance, like, wow, you could really kill someone over there, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. And I suppose all crime writers are the same, you know, we always you just like living living a full life i think gives you so much to talk about so yeah saying yes to loads of stuff i, I like getting in scrapes I, I really like it um and um it's, it's got yeah but uh, maybe over a beer nick we could talk about some of these yeah. things that have but, happened but that, that sense of a dark humor undertone was that something that you kind of i guess that's just your voice into it as a writer to a degree but it's something that you you know you deliberately brought into the trilogy that sort of like kind of sort of like down to earth humor in there i think because uh, it's what i like to read myself um yeah. in uh, one of my favorite series just ever is um adrian mckinty's uh, duffy series yeah. Yeah. um and that always had that incredible vein of dark humor yeah. through it um yeah, yeah. I, I think that guy is a wizard by the way but that he, the the humor in that made those books so you know they were so hard hitting but so entertaining at the same time and at the end of the day you know i want to entertain I want people to, and I also want people to laugh despite themselves at times, yeah. you know, and I, I want you to, you know, as readers, I want readers to ask the same questions of themselves, you know, uh, you know, so if I'm making you ask difficult questions of yourself, that's something I, I, I'm happy to have done. Excellent. And just to pick up again a bit on the research that you mentioned, was the, there's some pretty gruesome stuff in there, isn't there, when it comes to, yeah. uh, to, to dead bodies and the such, like, was that kind of, how do you go about kind of finding out that type of stuff? Is that, um, yeah, is that kind of book learning, or is that more getting yourself into sort of like scrapes, bouting the real world again? I mean, I, I imagine we're talking because I get I, I get a lot of DMs about this. Uh, is this about the, um, the the method of killing? Of well, one, you know? yeah, I mean, part of that I'm just part of the, you know the descriptions of the bodies when they're found and stuff. You know, it's the kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, you yeah. kind of wince a little bit and go, oh, I don't need to know that. Thank you very much, Robert. That's a little bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine my mum listening to listening yeah, to these yeah, audio books. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think certainly everything is as real as I can make it. Yeah. Um, so that mode of killing that you're talking about is all real. Um, that came from, um, I think it was a UN peacekeeping handbook, uh, that one. Um, but the uh, as something to watch out for. Uh, the uh, I can't believe I've managed to say that without giving a major spoiler as well. So I'm really, really chuffed. Move there, on, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and regarding the other stuff, um, I... Ah, people have said that actually that the books can be quite grisly and I've never it's never an intention but I do want I do find that if if you paint things in very clear pictures um the readers on un, readers understand the stakes very quickly so the stakes are very high you know and especially if you it, it, I, I always feel when I'm writing these that everyone's only one bad decision away from just being meat bone gristle that's it, you know, and I really want the stakes to represent that as well, you know, so, um, but no, research, I think, you know, like all crime writers, I wouldn't go anywhere near my Google history, wouldn't, no, no, <laughs> wouldn't, no, no, wouldn't no. want to be doing that, <laughs> um, and, uh, but I do do things like, you know, um, type in stuff like, well, how long would a, you know, what, what, would there be what level of deterioration are we talking about if something has been submerged in water for, you know, six months at, 10 degrees Celsius, that kind of thing, you know, and then I build from there, you know, and I also agree with that thing that a little bit of detail goes a long way. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, um, and leaving the um, or the the reader to sort of to pick up and make their own pictures from there. Um, just enough to spark nightmares, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think if somebody says, if you know three facts about something, then that's enough to convince people you're an expert, isn't it? So That's it, that's uh, yeah, it. Yeah. And that's, I apply that to the police procedural stuff as well. Yeah. Um, I think I had a great chat with another brilliant Northern writer called Nick Oldham. And um, Nick Oldham said to me, because uh, I was asking him, and he's an ex-cop himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, um, he said, oh, just don't, People don't want to read reams and reams of procedure. They just want a handful of facts that are actually bob on, and then they're happy to go along with anything. Yeah, it was one of the, that's one of the most important bits of advice I think I was ever given because I was thinking that authors like himself would be looking at police procedurals, going, "Oh, I can't read this. It's so unrealistic." That kind of thing, yeah. and he's actively saying. Yeah, don't care about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's next then, Rob? Um, I guess it's like eyes down for the, the final part of the trilogy. Is that is it complete yet? What's what's the situation? Yeah, um, I'm uh, writing the the third one. I, I have to be honest, Nick. I'm finding it because because the reviews for this new one are, are the best I've ever had. Um, so I'm I'm absolutely delighted people are connecting it connecting with it the way they are. But I feel the pressure. I feel that yeah. like I've got it, and and because I know it's got to end. So I know it's called The Only Truly Dead because that's in the contract. So I know I can say that. Um, and I know that it'll be with us. Well, I, again, I, d I don't really know. They, they, I think they're hoping that it'll be either early next year or late this year. Um, but it's, got, it's all got to end here. Um, I've got another series out on submission at the moment, um, which is uh, totally different. Just an, uh, You know, when you get that thing where you've got um, an itch you need to scratch, like I've yeah. just got to write this, I, I need to do it. Um, and it's about a, um, I can't say the title, but it's about um, a special constable uh, in a small village who's, um, yeah, he is being put out to pasture, uh, ousted out to one side. He's in his 70s. He doesn't want to retire yet, but they give him all the yeah. terrible jobs. And um, one night uh, they give him the phone and it's a little girl whose mum and dad have gone to the pub. And uh, the northern setting again here, Nick. And uh, they, they're like, um, she says she sees a monster in the garden. And she's terrified. So he goes round, goes outside to show that there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong. The light pops on, boop. Uh, you know, the security light, boop. And he does see something he can't explain. And <laughs> no. yeah. <laughs> and then there's the unravel from there because obviously no one believes him and he's got to go on a sort of a, a journey himself to um, establish what's going on. But I had, I've had an absolute riot writing that. I, I, again, I just had so much fun. So it's more kind of a bit of a crossover in a sense, maybe a bit of, I'm sensing a little yeah. bit of horror possibly in there. Maybe not. I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah. crime, what, what we're getting from publishers actually is, um, oh, the book's really, really great, really good, but what genre is it? <laughs> how, yeah. do I, how do I sell it? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm sure, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. I hope we find a home soon for it. Um, I do believe in, in transparency, transparency in the industry as well. So I'm very happy to talk about you know that and and for for writers who are you know um ha having an uncertain period or whatever i mean here we were just talking before coming on air nick you know between us we've got so many books between us and and uncertain periods do happen i don't know what what book this is coming out i don't know who's going to take it when it's coming out or anything like that and this is i think this is yeah this will be my 10th novel so it's nothing's ever set in stone brilliant super thanks rob that's been great to chat to you sir People can listen to And Your Enemies Closer now on Audible if they wish to, or they can catch up by either listening to or reading um, by From the Tree in Print as well. So brilliant. We look forward to the third part of the trilogy. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much, Nick. I appreciate Thank you. It.